one and a half sit-ups. And that half is very important to acknowledge, as it was a great marker of success for me getting over one sit-up in my fitness testing at year seven at school. Fair to say I was an unlikely Olympian. I started rowing because one of my friends at school wanted to try it. She didn't know anyone at the local club. She had to ask me about seven times, and just to shut her up, I finally said, yes, okay. And I went down, and I absolutely loved it from the start. That is no small feat for someone like me who hated exercise and PE at school. But I loved the rhythm of the movement. I loved being in a boat with my mates. I loved being outside in nature after a day at school and all of the stresses that come from being a teenage girl. It was pure escapism and joy for me. But I wasn't one of those 12-year-old kids who dream of going to the Olympics because to me, it was just a whole other world away from where I was. I just loved the sport, so I went to more training sessions because I trained more, I got faster, I started winning things, which is always nice, and incrementally, year on year, I aimed a little bit higher. And it wasn't until the summer of 2011 that I seriously considered myself as having the potential to go to an Olympic Games. At that point, I was third in the country, and you needed to be top two to be selected in my event. So, three weeks after starting a degree down the road at Durham University, I packed up my uni room, I turned back up on my parents' doorstep, fair to say they weren't super impressed with me at that point in time, and I told them I just need to give rowing one more year to find out if I can make it, if I don't, I'll always regret not knowing. And that idea of having no regrets was a massive driver for me while I was training, and it was a big marker of success after I retired. Another driver, although I didn't know it at the time, showed itself to me in the toilets of the River Tees Water Sports Centre that winter. I had just finished throwing my guts up in the toilet, I came out, I was washing my hands. Don't know if you've ever seen a rower's hands, probably not, they're not a pretty sight. I had blisters all over my palms and the skin was peeling off. My knuckles were cracked and bleeding from being out in the cold and calloused all over. I was coming down to weight because I was a lightweight, I had to weigh in for my event. My skin looked horrendous because of that and my face was drawn. And I think when you're an elite athlete and you're pushing your mind and your body to such limits every day, you constantly live with these two little voices inside your head. And there was one voice which, however hard I tried, <laughs> wouldn't go away. And it constantly said, give it up. Just go home, have a good meal, have a good sleep. Get an office job where you can sit in one of those comfy, squishy swivel chairs and turn up at nine. But I really remember in that moment, this other voice just said, eight months. In eight months' time, there is an Olympic Games coming to your country. You can be there, and then you can retire, relax, and live happily ever after. <laughs> so fast forward to 11.57 a.m., Super Saturday 2012. I crossed the finish line of the Olympic Games with my partner Sophie in first place. And <laughs> Thanks. And I felt nothing short of a childlike pure excitement and joy. And I remember standing on the medal podium and you've got the family and friends grandstand in front of you and I had all my family and my friends and I could see them and my dad was crying and I just remember thinking this was worth everything and more. I felt redeemed, I felt released, I felt shocked, I felt elated, all wrapped up in this one magical morning. But... 
a week later, it wasn't enough. And not only was it not enough, it was actually somehow worse because I was supposed to feel so happy all the time. I was supposed to feel completely content and fulfilled like I didn't need anything else in the world in life. I was supposed to think that I was amazing and full of pride and full of power. And yeah, I felt loads of positive emotions associated with that win and that medal. But I also couldn't fight this creeping feeling of anti-climax. I realized that life, surprisingly, was still the same. And I had the same thoughts and the same thoughts about myself. If anything, they were more extreme now. Was that a fluke? You've peaked too early, 21. Downhill from here, life's over. Can I go again? Should I go again? If you're a real champion, you'd win two times, three times, four times, do a Steve Redgrave. Ironically, being the best in the world at something had made me more unconfident than I had ever been in my life before. So, what was my smart, considered solution? <laughs> Go again. Success and winning in Rio would surely give me that happily ever after. So, I buried my head back into training, into the thing that I was used to. I declined invites to a lot of the cool events that come from winning in Olympic Games. I put my medal in a drawer and I thought that I could take it out and enjoy it when I was done, when I'd achieved success and won in Rio. And in hindsight, it seems a bit ridiculous and quite sad to me that this thing that I'd given all of myself to getting, I couldn't enjoy for longer than a week. We didn't win in Rio. We didn't actually even make the podium. We came 14th. And yeah, I was heartbroken and weirdly felt numb at the same time. But I really quickly arrived at this place of self-belief, of quiet confidence, and a weird sense of peace because I'd had this massive thing happen to me, this thing that I'd been petrified of happening, this massive failure, and I realized that life went on, that most people don't care about rowing, that they have their own stuff to think about, right? No one gives a second thought about how fast I can go in a boat, who cares? <laughs> I realized most people don't actually even care about the Olympics a few weeks after it's happened. I still have my family, my friends, my partner, my pug, Doug, very important, and a roof over my head to go home to. It was okay. It also gave me one of the biggest lessons I've had, which was that my happiness and my identity didn't have to be wrapped up in the results that I got on the water. And that was just as meaningful and impactful in terms of my life and how I think now as my medal in London. So when I retired, I went into coaching other high performance athletes and executive leaders. And that made me reflect a lot on my career and what I would want to pass on and what I definitely wouldn't. And this idea about success came up a lot to me. How do we define success? What is it? Why do we strive towards it? And success should be a positive thing, right? It's a positive term. It's something we aspire towards. We throw so much time and energy into achieving it. So shouldn't we get a result that gives back in equal measure? Shouldn't the result be something long lasting? And if it wasn't, why not? So I'm going to preface what I say next by saying that my world was competition and I don't think that chasing objective results and high performance is a bad thing. I actually think the opposite. I think it helps us realize our potential as people and I think there's real value in that. But I wonder if we sometimes think too narrowly about success and if we broadened our view of success, if we could better support athlete mental well-being. So firstly, I think if we stick to this two-dimensional, lazy view of success that society sometimes pushes us towards, 
the gold medal, the A-star grade, the next promotion at work, without thinking much more deeply about it than that. Then really quickly, after we've achieved that, the goalpost will just shift and we'll be back on that hamster wheel chasing the next thing and we'll go round and round and round until the end of time. So what if, as well as chasing that outcome goal, we looked at success as being an accumulation of day-to-day -day achievements? It sounds simple, but one of the best things that my psychologist did with me when I was rowing was he got me to stick a kid's gold star sticker, like what you get in primary school, in the top right-hand corner of my training diary every day that I'd done my best or I'd made an improvement. And that might be I'd technically improved, I'd gritted through a tough session, I had communicated a bit better with my teammates. And that meant that after Rio, I could look back and at a glance, I could see one, two, three, four years worth of days of success, of days where I tried to do something massive, I'd stuck my neck on the line, and I'd showed up, and I'd trained each day with passion and grit. And that is something that every athlete can achieve, no matter what the result, and something that will take them further than sport. Linking to that, I think we need to move away from this black and white version of success, where everything that's not a gold medal is complete and utter failure, because that's what I thought before Rio. To do this, we need to support our athletes to develop self-compassion, to enable them to have fair and rational debriefs of their performances. And if I'm being really honest here, self-compassion can be a really scary thing to talk about in the high-performance world. I would have thought when I was training that self-compassion is an excuse for losers. It's a way to make ourselves feel better about not winning. And I would be scared to develop it because I thought that it might make me settle for less. And in actual fact, it's completely the opposite. We know there's so much psychological research now that shows that self-compassion is one of the best tools we have in overcoming adversity and developing resilience. And that word resilience is thrown around so much when we talk about high performance. Self-compassion is the key. Really easy way of doing this. Instead of seeing success as black and white, one simple goal, we look at success as having three levels. You've got your minimum acceptable version of success, the desired version, the thing you've got in mind that you're looking for, and then the wild, great dream version of success. Ironically, I think that by doing these simple changes will actually make athletes more likely to achieve the results that they're going for, because a relaxed, happy athlete is a fast athlete. To that, I can testify. So, are Olympic champions successful? I'm going to cop out of answering that, and I'm going to leave that for you to decide. What I would urge you to consider, though, when answering, is what success really means. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the people that you coach and lead? And is there a way that we can marry up the vision of success that focuses on the thing that society pushes us towards, the results-based vision? with something that has a long-lasting, positive, meaningful impact on the people around us. That, to me, is the next level of coaching, and that is where the real gold lies. Thank you. <laughs>